Hello, and welcome to another Adult Coloring Tuesday tutorial. I'm your host and your artist, Lisa Mitrokin. And today, we're having a seance. It's 2020, a brand new year and a brand new decade. And in our coloring future, I see more glow effects and tricks of the light. For this session, I chose a very special page from my book, Nights and Mare's Circus. It's special because it's a portrait of my dear friend and a great colorist, Madame Laurie. And it's a perfect page for us to practice our glow effects on because of this magical crystal ball that she has that we can make glow. So today I will show you how to depict a realistic light source that is located in the middle of the composition. Some of the elements in the scene will be underlit, some side lit, some fully lit, and some partially lit, and some backlit. So let's get right to it, shall we? I printed my drawing on gray toned paper. When working with glow effects, having toned paper gives you a great head start. It already sets the darker mood and gives you your midtones but this paper isn't dark enough for the shadow effects that I want. So I actually start by creating the atmosphere of a dark room with watercolors. By the way, all the materials that I use in any given episode are listed in the video description below. So you can check that out after the show. All the links to featured books, my groups, my other social media links, they're all down there as well. And while you're in that general area of the screen, don't forget to give this video the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you don't already. Anyway, I want this crystal ball to be the main light source here. So what I'm doing with watercolors is establishing all the areas that will not be affected by the crystal ball light. I'm not concerned with the exact colors here. I'm not even concerned with detail yet. In fact, I chose watercolor for this part because it's fast and because I can use broad, kind of sloppy brush strokes very quickly to fill in the shadowed parts. How am I deciding which parts to shade? Pretty much everything that's not immediately near the sphere. For now. More detail will come later. For my colors, I'm using only purple and brown with a touch of black and blue here and there. Once the watercolor paint dries, I will be able to add new colors and detail over it. But for now, I just need to cover a lot of surface area fast so that I can move on to the fun part. The fun part, of course, being the globe itself. This is where I need to get into more theory on light and how it behaves. If you saw my tutorials on glowing fireplaces, Christmas lights, and pumpkins, you remember that when drawing and coloring, we can't get any lighter than white. So for an object to appear like it glows, the trick is to make the shiniest part pure white and everything else around it darker than it actually would be in real life. This way, by contrast, the white object will appear to have luminance. Here, the brightest object in the room is the crystal ball, so I'm coloring it in pure solid white. It's tempting to go crazy and start adding little crystal effects, glass effects, little reflections and sparkles, but try to stay away from that if you want the ball to actually glow. Remember, we never paint or color the object itself. We paint and color what the brain perceives when the eyes look at it. When you look at a glowing light bulb, for instance, you don't see the shine on the glass, you just see the glow. A plain white fill on this sphere is a much stronger effect than getting into full detail. I'm using white charcoal to color in my globe. You can also use white pencils, white acrylic paint, gesso, white gel pens, anything that will give you a pure white surface without wrinkling the page. You can even cut out a white shape from a different paper and glue it on. Look at that. So simple and it's already starting to look like the sphere is glowing. Wait till you see what comes next. Now we need to cast some light onto the objects around the sphere. Here you need to imagine it as a three-dimensional scene. The position of the hands is very helpful in this particular example. You understand that there's this empty space between the sphere and the hands and the sphere and the face and the sphere and the skulls. And this is the tricky part. When depicting glow, many colorists try to somehow color the empty space itself with light effects. The most common way is to add light rays or bright colors like yellow or orange. This can be a cool effect if you're going for a cartoony look. But if you want more realism, 
there's a better way to go about it. We don't see light as it travels through air. We see it when it lands on objects. So now, seeing this as a three-dimensional space, decide how bright the sphere is. What I mean is, how far do you think the light will travel from the sphere? This is important to determine straight away. There will essentially be another sphere. This is the glow, like the, the aura around the crystal ball. I imagine that in my case, it will span out to about the edges of the page. Keep in mind that this aura needs to be consistent in intensity and distance from the surface. Because the glowing object is a simple sphere, you can't have one part of it give more light than the other. But we do have objects obstructing the glow, and those are the parts that will be lit by the sphere. The closest objects to my light source here are the hands, and it's the insides of the hands that will be the most lit. I add white highlights here with white charcoal, and make sure that these areas are bright, but not as bright as the light itself. To tone my effect down a bit, I blend it gently with a Q-tip. See the difference in the white? The hands are very well lit. They're almost white, but not quite perfectly white. The sphere is a little bit brighter. And now, by contrast, the back of the hands look like they're in shadow. This is exactly why I love gray paper so much. As soon as I add my brightest highlights, these shadows just happen naturally. I will, of course, also enhance them with pencils, but at least now I can see where they are. The next object closest to the light source is the cat skull necklace that she has on her chest. And then the face and the chin of the character. This is the most interesting part for me. The face that's lit from an unusual angle. Once again, you must train your mind to see this as a three-dimensional scene, with three-dimensional objects in it. Faces around it. And, and have features that are like reliefs on the surface of the planet. When there's a simple direct light source, understanding the shape of the face comes in handy. Thankfully, we all already have an intuitive understanding of a three-dimensional shape of a human face. This is, after all, an image that we interact with the most. So trust yourself on this. Trust your intuition. I guarantee you, you already know more about face structure than you think. I start with the parts of the face that are the closest to the light source, and also the surface area that are facing the light. So that's the chin, the neck, that area between the eyelids and the eyebrows, the cheeks, and the bottom of the nose. Again, I'm blending with a Q-tip, making the light effect obvious, but soft. Notice that the light effect on the face is not as bright as it is on the hands. The skulls are mostly backlit. We will see very little glow on them. But we will still see some, especially on the ones that are facing out to the sides. Now for the shadow definition. It's kind of tempting at this point to just leave things the way they are. It does already look like a glow effect and it looks really good, but we can do better. We can make the glow look stronger by making the shadows darker. Here's where you can throw everything you've ever learned about skin tone coloring right out the window. It really doesn't matter what the actual color and tone of her skin is. From her features, and in this case because I actually know her in real life, we can tell that she's Caucasian, so we're dealing with light skin. But the parts of her skin that are illuminated by the crystal ball will be overexposed, meaning they will appear almost white. And the parts of her skin that are not illuminated by anything will be underexposed, meaning there's just not enough light to show the actual color. So the areas where these two meet are very small and delicate. These are the only areas that will reveal anything close to her actual skin color. The rest is all light and shadow effects. For my base shadow color, I'm working with chestnut brown. And I gently color in all the areas that are not white. Make sure to keep that transition from brown to white very soft and gentle. That doesn't mean that it can be a fast and obvious transition, but it just shouldn't be a solid line. You should have a little bit of a gradient. I create my gradients by barely touching the surface of the paper with the brown pencil, and going over the areas that need more pigment more times. You don't need to apply more pressure to the areas that you want to be darker. You just need to add more pigment. So just keep adding layer after layer until you get the effect that you like. To further smooth out my gradient, I'm introducing a new color, cream. This is a very light yellowish color. If you don't have that exact pencil in your set, don't sweat it. You can use a uh, yellow pencil very lightly or peach, or eggshell, anything that's light and kind of yellowish or creamy. This isn't an exact formula. This is just what works for me in this particular case. 
I keep building up my shadows with an even darker brown. In this case, it's dark umber. But again, any dark brown color will work just as well. The skull necklace and the chest will cast a small but strong shadow, right there. Remember that the backs of the hands have no light cast on them, but there is some light spilling from between the fingers. So the skin will appear the darkest in the center parts. Now chestnut. I like this color because it's a nice balance between brown and purple. Since I want this whole scene to be mainly in purple tones, I'm starting to introduce more colors that will take me towards that effect. And now for the purple itself. I use it to darken the shadows even further and bring out the darkest elements of the face like uh, the lips and the eyelashes. Depending on how realistic and detailed you want your coloring to be, you can take these effects even further. The other thing about working with this kind of a scene is that you have to consider the mood. I want this room to be shrouded in mystery and unseen things in the shadows. So for me, less detail is a more desirable effect. The rest of this is fine tuning the scene, making things darker all around and establishing some definition on the woodwork. But these are all elements that are less interesting to me, so they get a lot less attention than the face and the glow effect. You want all the attention to be on the center of the page. That's where the story is. Don't distract your viewers with brightly colored and fancy details on the woodwork and the frame when you have a spectacular glow effect that they should be enjoying. But the skulls, the skulls are very interesting. They have great shapes and are positioned in a perfect way to demonstrate the backlit effect. Remember that aura of light around the crystal ball? It exists in a three-dimensional space. Here, the light is coming towards us, but it doesn't travel forever. The glow extends only about an arm's length out in every direction, or maybe even less. So looking at this composition, all three of the skulls have their backs lit. With a center skull, we can't see the back at all, but there will be some light spill around. So his edges will be lit, not white, but light, and the entire visible surface area of the front will be dark, with the center being the darkest and he will cast a shadow in front of him as well. The skulls on the left and the right are lit the same exact way, but we are positioned differently, so we see them from a different angle. More of their side view is revealed to us, so we will see more of the light on the back and some shadow going along the edge towards the nose of each of them. I'm using brown, gray, purple, and cream for my skull colors. An interesting fact about the skulls, and this page in general actually, is that most of the objects here are real things that all came from my studio. This page was a commission page, you see. These skulls are real roadkill skulls that I've cleaned and painted and Lori has collected over the years. The skull necklace and the bird talent earrings are real accessories that Lori owns in real life, all from my Knights and Mares toy shop. I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I actually work with animal remains, mostly as a hobby. I don't like for animal remains to go to waste, especially when their deaths are the direct result of human intervention, like highways. So when I see roadkill, I stop, I pick it up, and I make art and jewelry out of the skulls, the bones, feathers, whatever I can use. Now for the page. Lori wanted to be a character in one of my books, and she wanted to be a fortune teller. By now you've probably figured out that the Knights and Mares book series is strongly influenced by my curiosity shop by the same name. So she had a photo shoot, and full costume, with all these props and sent me a bunch of photos to work with. Based on several photos that she sent, I drew this coloring page that you can now find in my book Knights and Mares Circus. There are two ways that you two can become a character in a book. One, every once in a while, it's the prize in a coloring event in my Facebook group Tom. If you're not already a member of Tom, come join us. I post a lot of gift pages there and we always have an event going on, always with a prize, like this. Two, one of the tiers in my Patreon community offers a personal page in a published book as one of its benefits, with the other benefits being a private lesson valued at $300, free copies of all pages from all my books ever published, private live streams, signed original art, and many more fun treats. So if you don't know about Patreon or don't know about my Patreon account, come check it out. And especially look at the Dragon Fox tier and become a character in my book. Of course, if that tier isn't right for you, I have many others to choose from, starting from just $1 a month, and they all include free gift pages and an occasional surprise gift page, so come visit me on Patreon and see which of the tiers is right for you. 
Even if you join for just a month, it helps me a great deal. I can't even tell you guys how much you help me out. Actually, you, my patrons, are a very strong force behind making this channel and weekly tutorials possible at all. Which is why all of my patrons of all tiers are personally thanked in the credits after each show. And on that note, let's roll the credits and add coloring time lapse. And I will say farewell, go make some awesome glow effects, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!